Thank you all for being here. I'd like to introduce a very special friend of MCJ, our fabulous Associate Dean, Dr. Honora Chapman, who wants to welcome you as well. Honora. Thank you, Betsy, so much. And thank you, everyone, for being here tonight. This is a very special event. We are so grateful to Tim Draklis for arranging this panel. We are extremely grateful to our esteemed visitors as well, who will be introduced properly in a moment. We are also grateful to Betsy Hayes for being a remarkable leader of a department that has been around as a discipline for 90 years. We are celebrating the existence of MCJ at Fresno State. And this is a great way to cap off this year. I see Latin up there on the screen, pro publica. It means for the public. It could mean for the republic if you add the word re, thing. But in any case, I want to talk about another Latin phrase that relates to our topic tonight. And it is the motto of the California State University system. These are the words we live by at Fresno State and all around the 23 campuses. And it's merely three Latin words that all start with a V. Vox, veritas, vita. We give our students a voice through fields such as MCJ and all the rest of them in our College of Arts and Humanities and across this campus. And through giving our students a voice, they speak the truth. The truth about their lived reality every day, the truth about the dreams, the things they want to accomplish in their lifetimes, their hopes for their careers and their families and their friends. That's their truth. That's your truth, students. And that's why we're here. And, in, and because you learn to speak your truth, you then get to have a great life, that vita that you are here laying the foundation for as students. We are very grateful to the community who has turned out tonight. I see old friends out there from Fresno State and across this valley. Thank you for being here and thank you for coming to Fresno State. Thank you so much, Dr. Chapman. We are so grateful for you and for Dean Jimenez Sandoval and all of your support for MCJ. Thank you. And now, please meet one of the newest additions to the Media Communications and Journalism Department and someone else who is truly a blessing to MCJ, our Roger Tatarian Journalism Scholar, Mr. Trim Draculis, who will get things started. Enjoy your evening. Star Wars uh, became chair this year, she's done a great job. Um, I just like to welcome all of you here to this Roger Deterrent Symposium. Well, I need my glasses, I'm sorry. Um, just want to briefly tell you the idea for this symposium. Starting from one basic thing. Oh, sorry. Yeah? The symposium started with one idea from one spot, a poll. Since 1972, the Gallup organization, which many of you have heard of, um, has been asking Americans how well they trust the media. In the most recent poll, which was taken in October of 2018, 45% of Americans said they either had a great deal of trust or a fair amount of trust in the media. In 1976, though, right after the Watergate affair, that figure was 72%. 72% of Americans said they had a great deal or a fair amount of trust in the media. 72% in 1976, 45% to them. Those figures are stark, and for some of us, they're certainly depressing. However, there's reason to be optimistic. If three quarters of the population once said they trusted the media, why can't that happen again? It's a movable thing. That's the purpose of today's symposium. How can we win back some people's trust? So to kick things off, I'm going to get right into it. I want to welcome Joe Kita, who is the uh, whose paper, Fresno B, uh, with help from Arizona State University's News Co-Lab, is actually in the middle of an effort um, to work on some of these issues. Uh, they're trying to increase Fresno area's news literacy through transparency and conversations. So, Joe. 
Thank all of you for being here today and taking the time to be with us. It is without any doubt that this is just fund fundamentally important to the future of civic life in Fresno, California, and beyond. And it sometimes feels to me that the organization that I lead, the Fresno Bee, is at the tip of the spear of this issue, especially during the last election when we sustained attacks from a local politician against our work and brought the issue of trust and news fluency to the fore here and into clear focus. Those of us at the B decided that the only and best way to handle this was to confront the issue head on. So with help from Arizona State's News CoLab and leading industry thinker Dan Gilmore and others, uh, we have made solid steps toward increasing the bee's transparency and building trust with our audience. We found a number of things to be true about this. One, that we don't really do a very good job of explaining the why and how of journalism. Two, that readers are often completely baffled by the process of journalism and how reporters do their jobs. And three, that many think the decisions we make every day in the newsroom are politically motivated. None of these things are true or fair, but as I wrote in a column last year, it's fair to say that we need to do a better job of explaining why. The processes that we use to generate news are in place to engender your trust, but we don't really tell you much about that, and this needs to change. Among the many steps we've taken at the B uh, is to try to give our audience a story behind the story with additional information that lists who we interview, who refused to comment, and other details that help peel away the layer from the story and give us a, a better impression of exactly how the journalism is created. Every major story now that's written at the Fresno Bee uh, has this information attached to it. And this adds greater depth to our work, and I hope it also adds trust in our reporting. It's almost like a footnote that you would find in a scholarly journal that kind of gives a little bit more information about the sourcing of our work. We've also worked to improve conversations in the community, and we recently convened a group of citizens to talk about Fresno's generations-old divide between North and South, the more prosperous North and the less prosperous and economically challenged South. We have been, even held a Saturday conference on the topic, and 100 people turned out. Imagine that, 100 people on Saturday. Uh, this also helped us form a working group that gives us valuable feedback. So at the core of all of this, really, is great journalism that rights wrongs and shines a light. And to that point, I'd like to introduce you to Stephen Engelberg, who truly is one of investigative journalism's brightest lights. I just met Steve last night, and I can tell you that the rumors are true. He's a kick-ass editor and reporter who cares a lot about his craft and is keenly interested in its future. Steve is editor-in-chief of ProPublica, an independent, nonprofit journalism newsroom that has the following mission statement, uh, one that I really love and which I'm going to quote here in full. I think it tells the story best. The mission is, quote, to expose abuses of power and betrayals of public trust by government, business, and other institutions using the moral force of investigative journalism to spur reform through the sustained spotlighting of wrongdoing. Steve joined, joined ProPublica as its, at its inception in 2008 as its founding managing editor and was promoted to editor-in-chief at the beginning of 2013. He previously was managing editor of the Oregonian in Portland and spent 18 years at the New York Times as editor and reporter, founding the paper's investigative team after serving as a reporter in Washington, D.C. and in Warsaw, Poland. He has a long list of awards to his credit, including two George Polk Awards as a reporter and as an editor on Pulitzer Prize winning projects at the Times and at the Oregonian. ProPublica now has a staff of more than 75 journalists covering such topics as government and politics, business, criminal justice, the environment, and more. But all investigative journalism is judged by its impact, and ProPublica's reporting has led to the passage of new laws, reversing policies, and accountability at all levels of government. And as, as Editor-in-Chief, Steve's fingerprints are all over this work. So let's give Steve a warm welcome to Fresno and Fresno State. I've got a lapel mic, but why not? Um, first of all, I'd like to thank uh, the Fresno State Department of Media, Communications, and Journalism 
for the chance to participate in this conversation, which I agree with our previous speakers here, is an incredibly important one. Um, and so, you know, where to begin on this question of not only where are we with fake news, but where are we in trusting the media, where are we in the news business, and, you know, there's a lot of sort of entry points that I thought about we could start with, but I'm afraid in this area they're really, you know, it, it always does seem to come back to, to one thing, and um, it is the words of our president. So I thought I would begin with a few of those and talk a little bit about the way language is being used and how that applies to the media, and then talk a little bit about the topic at hand, which is fake news, which is, you'll hear, I think maybe isn't the right way to think about this, but, but we'll get there. So, recently the New York Times reported that the President had called the Acting Attorney General and tried, in essence, to get him to fix the case that involved payments to Stormy Daniels that was then being investigated by federal prosecutors in Manhattan, and he had a tweet. The New York Times reporting is false. They are a true, all caps, enemy of the people. Teenager recently sued the Washington Post for $250 million, which even to Jeff Bezos, I suppose, is some amount of money. Uh, and the question uh, was surrounding how the paper had written about the Covington High School kerfuffle. You may remember this. This is the video of the kid and the Native Americans and so on and so forth. Covington student suing WAPO. Go get them, Nick. Fake news. A couple of weeks ago, Saturday Night Live aired an episode in which Alec Baldwin tried to impersonate the president, and my friends who work in comedy say it really wasn't very funny because it kind of was just like the press conference, um, only with Alec Baldwin, um, didn't really work. Uh, Trump had his own review, he tweeted that out, and he said, nothing funny about Tired Saturday Night Live on fake news NBC. Question is, how do the networks get away with all these total Republican hit jobs without retribution? Likewise for many other shows. Very unfair, should be looked into. This is real collusion. And we had a few months ago just, you know, I think worth reminding us all, uh, there was a story on NBC the president didn't like, and he said, with all the fake news coming out of NBC and the networks, at what point is it appropriate to challenge their license? Bad for country. All right, lots to unpack here. First, I would like to begin with one of the sort of big catchphrases in all of this, which was fake news. The reason we're here today. Now, I do think these words, fake news, once did have a clear meaning. And it was pretty much entirely untrue stories posted by teenagers living in Albania. They were put out online to actually make money for these kids, because you get the hits and you get some money, and it was, you know, we all saw them. They were frequently on Facebook, wherever. Hillary has rare brain disease given months to live. The guy who played Leave it to Beaver just died. We've all seen these things, and you know, look, I, I'm a professional journalist, and I click on some of them, it's like, really, the guy from Beaver? That's terrible. It doesn't turn out to be true. Um, and, you know, this is like a lot of things in the world of the internet. Because uh, I believe the internet is not some new terrible thing, it's just, us only blown up even more. And, you know, those of us of a, of a, of a certain age, myself, uh, you know, uh, we used to go to the supermarket and there would be supermarket tabloids right at the checkout. They're still there, but not as, as, as much as they used to be. And, you know, the headline would say, you know, three-headed kid found in Bulgaria, you know, Loch Ness Monster, it's real. And, you know, you look at it and go, ah, that's a fake photo. Uh, so, I mean, fake news really is just the descendant of you know, this kind of um, rollicking, you know, fun that no, thing that nobody took seriously. But now, with the help of algorithms, you know, and I think sometimes some Russian spies, uh, fake news has become both more prevalent, more easily circulated, more consequential. So, what do we make of the president's use of this word, fake news? What does he mean by it? And I don't think he means what I just said. Um, I think he'd like to confuse the terminology, but I think what he really means is that fake news, in general, is journalism that does not endorse his view of reality. 
Thus, NBC, when it writes a story that the White House doesn't like, is fake news NBC. Obviously, this kind of terminology coming from the President of the United States is damaging for the credibility of the news media. And it's one many people in the President's base have happily embraced. Fake news, meaning information so false it should be disregarded without a glance, is now being redefined as anything that conflicts with the view of the White House. So for that reason, I hit henceforth put forth a modest proposal, which I'm sure nobody will pay any attention to, but if I had the power, I would retire the term entirely fake news, because I think it's lost its meaning. I don't think we agree on what it means anymore. I think it's used in ways that don't really communicate what is meant. So if we want to talk about deliberately false stories propagated on the internet, I am very much in favor of a term that the scholar Catherine Paul Jameson has come up with. She likes to call it VD. That's right, VD. Viral deception. That would be stories, posts, tweets that are based on provably fabricated information. That's a thing that no democracy wants to become part of a serious conversation about something like, say, Britain's withdrawal from the EU. So I would propose, and again, I don't think anyone will listen, that journalists at least should stop using the term fake news entirely unless it's, it's in a quotation. Now, I was speaking earlier with a group of high school students who run a, a high school publication of some note here. I got a very good question from one of the students, which I, I think I'd like to explore right here, which is why is there more fake news? What, 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 you know, beyond sort of what I mentioned earlier with the algorithms, why is this something we're all sort of worried about or thinking about? And again, here I do mean fake news in the sense of, you know, things that are fabricated. Um, and I think it's sort of a good news story. Um, it's a piece of a good news story. And the good news is that a generation or two ago, the access to media, creation of media, was something that required an enormous amount of money. You needed to have the amount of money it would take to buy a printing press and newsprint. There were tremendous barriers to access and providing people with information. Uh, you know, there, there was an old saying in the news business, don't get, you know, in, into a fight with a guy who buys ink by the bucket. Well, that was a fairly arrogant phrase we used to say uh, among ourselves, because what it really means is don't fight with us, we own the information and the means of distributing it, you don't. Um, well, that's no longer true. I mean, today, anybody can be a distributor of news. The internet has taken away all of what you might call, what economists would call barriers to entry. There are no barriers to entry. Um, you have a computer, you have a high, well, Wi-Fi connection, um, you can report a story. Now, it's true that you know the New York Times or Washington Post has greater ability to get it to readers, um, but there is power in an individual as a distributor, a reporter, a chronicler of news. You know, if we think back to the experience Brian Williams had, he was a high-flying network anchor who had been telling a story about his time in Iraq, and a single guy who had been on a helicopter put a Facebook post up to his, whatever, 200 followers uh, that said, I was there when he, these things he said happened, and they didn't happen that way. Next thing you know, Brian Williams is out of a job. So the democratization of news is a good thing, but with a good thing like on so many things on the internet come complexity. Anyway, to continue with sort of presidential terminology, I'd like to go to one of my next favorite phrases, enemy of the people. This is a frequently used thing in the president's tweets. And as somebody who grew up covering the, the Reagan White House, Reagan was the first president I covered as a, a Washington-based correspondent, it, it's particularly odd to me because the Republican Party that I was covering in the 80s um, was sort of implacably opposed to the then communist ideology that ruled about half the word, and their favorite derogatory term for people they didn't like was enemy of the people. But that has now been picked up and turned into something very different. Now the president has met with members of the media, most recently uh, the publisher of the New York Times, A.G. Sulzberger, who said to him, when you use this kind of terminology, it's actually dangerous. We have uh, you know, a country where passions are running high, 
uh, people have access to guns, this is, this is not um, necessarily going to end well. Now, the president clearly does not agree with this. It, it is from his tweets and his speeches clear that to him, enemy of the people is just another sort of spirited political nickname along the lines of low energy Jeb or little Marco. But let's be clear, this is more than low energy Jeb. Um, there is a deeper intent here, I would argue, much like the words fake news, and it is to devalue news outlets that are not sufficiently fulsome in their praise for the administration's good works. Again, this too drives viewers and readers to distrust the things they read or hear from news sources, much as the attacks on Mueller's 13 or 17 at various day-to-day -day angry Democrats are aimed at discrediting and advance the findings of the Mueller investigation. Now that said, the president's constant use of this term poses a dilemma for the media, and it's one that's not easily solved. Every time he says the news media is the enemy of the people, the news media writes a story about it. And thus we begin a predictable cycle in which the president calls out the enemies of the people and the commentators shriek in horror, and the president does it again. And once again, I make my modest proposal, maybe we could all do a little less of that. Um, Sewell Chan here is in the audience in a position of authority over the Los Angeles Times, so as a person who's publishing a major, helping to publish a major newspaper, perhaps he can help us. But the fact of the matter is we all get into it and everybody feels that they have to be competitive and off we go. Um, now, I, I do think that we want to be very clear that it's not a guarantee, but I think it is a plausible outcome that somebody somewhere will read one of these things, pick up an assault weapon, and go to self-investigate, just as somebody did back a few years ago to check out the ludicrous but widely circulated theory that Hillary Clinton was part of a pedophile ring run from a DC pizza joint. That really happened, and the guy really did show up with the gun. Fortunately, he didn't shoot anybody. Now finally, there is a word that caught my eye in the Saturday Night Live tweet that I hadn't seen before from Trump, and it got me thinking, and that word was retribution. As in, how do the networks get away with these total Republican hit jobs without retribution? Now to be fair, Trump is not the first president to threaten a reporter or a news organization. I had some fun looking this up. Um, probably goes back to George Washington, though I didn't find any examples of that, but I, one of my favorites was Harry Truman. Harry Truman's daughter was a singer, and the Washington Post music critic wrote a review that said, she cannot sing very well, she is flat a good deal of the time. Well, the president didn't like this at all, and he dashed off a letter to the Post. He said, the president of the United States, he, he addressed it to the, the uh, music critic. I've just read your lousy review of Margaret's concert. I've come to the conclusion that you are an eight ulcer man on four ulcer pay. It seems to me you are a frustrated old man who wishes he could have been successful. When you write such poppycock, as was in the back section of the paper you work for, it shows conclusively that you're off your beam. And at least four of your ulcers are working. Someday I hope to meet you. When that happens, you'll need a new nose, a lot of beefsteak for black eyes, and perhaps a supporter below. <laughs> Interestingly enough, the Post publisher, Philip Graham, vetoed the idea of publishing this letter. Said it was probably the president on a bad day. But the critic talked about it to a competitor, competing newspaper's critic, and that critic told the editor, and pretty soon the next thing you know, it was, on, it was in another newspaper in the Washington area that didn't longer exist, and then it was on the AP, and everybody was talking about it. Anyway, it was a kinder, gentler time. Uh, all of the participants in this incident moved on. Margaret Truman never sang again in public, but became a successful writer of mystery novels. It's a true story. The Post critic, Paul Hume, forgave the president as being an overprotective father, and years later, he actually visited Truman in Independence, Missouri, where he was retired, and the two of them went together to a concert. No eyes were blackened. No supporter was needed. Fast forward to the Watergate years, and Graham's widow, Catherine Graham, is now the publisher of the Washington Post. Woodward and Bernstein are confronting the Attorney General of the United States, John Mitchell, who uh, was 
in fact, involved deeply in both the uh, Watergate burglary and the subsequent cover-up. Uh, Woodward and Bernstein run the story by the Attorney General. All the facts are going to relate about uh, money that was used for illegal activities. And Mitchell's response is written down by the reporters went like this. That went like this. All that crap? You're putting it in the paper? It's all been denied. Katie Graham's going to get her tit caught in a big fat ringer if that's published. Good Christ. That's the most sickening thing I've ever heard. Well, Richard Nixon didn't have any tweets, but he did have an enemies list. And um, his threats to the Post were actually more than just about Kay Graham's anatomy. Uh, later on, he had a meeting with the top people at the White House, and the Watergate tapes were rolling, and he said that he wanted the Washington Post to have damnable, damnable problems when it came time for them to go to the FCC to renew their license for their TV stations in Florida. And sure enough, they did. Post ended up spending $1 million back when that was actually money, and two and a half years to keep the ownership of properties that were helping to keep them afloat. So the notion of retribution against news organizations is nothing new, but I would argue it is a great deal more concerning today in this era of squeezed profit margins and ailing business models for the media. Our media outlets right now are actually far less healthy financially than they've ever been Libel suits, fights over government documents, records requests, they all pose greater risk and are more expensive uh, than a lot of these places can afford. In the face of this, we do have an increasingly polarized political system. We have the Trump base on one side, the energized left wing of the Democratic Party on the other side, shouting at each other across a very wide chasm. MAGA and build the wall, is met by Medicare for all, abolish ICE, and tax the very rich. So, let's go to the core question tonight. How does the vigilant news consumer or journalist protect him or herself from what we initially termed fake news, but what we're now gonna call, just for fun, viral deception, or VD? And along the way, how can media regain some of the trust that's been lost in the political wars of the last decade? Well, this is no simple matter. VD is everywhere. It can be hard to spot. It can be communicated by people who appear trustworthy. Sometimes trustworthy sources can pick it up inadvertently from dishonest partners. Okay, okay, I'm stopping here. That's pushing this as far as it can go. But the first question we should ask about a piece of journalism, or if we have to call it content, I prefer to say journalism, but you know we now say content in the business, that one reads is a simple one. What is the source of the information? Where does it come from? At ProPublica, we've made it a practice, as I hear our colleagues at the Fresno Bee are doing, to try to be more transparent about the underlying sources of our work. If we quote a document, we try to put it up on the web so readers can see for themselves. Did we get it right? Did we get it in context? Are we cherry picking or is this honestly done? When we do statistics and calculations, and we do a lot of data journalism at ProPublica, this is a new field in media where we're you know, able, I think, sometimes to get to really profoundly important truths um, that were not available to reporters a generation ago. But when we do data journalism or calculations, we produce our own paper of how we did it. And we put it up so experts in the field and look at what we did, what we chose to do, what we didn't choose to do, and try to replicate our work, and frankly, call us out if they think we're wrong, and some of them have. And we've engaged in conversations with some of those experts over time to say, well, we saw it this way for this reason, and sometimes we've adjusted the work that we do. If there's video or audio, we try to put it up with the story. If we made ethical decisions that were complicated or difficult, we try to tell you about them. We have a program airing tonight on CBS Frontline involving uh, a man who is trying to live in supported housing in New York City with severe mental illness. Uh, we followed him for many months. It was a difficult question to know, could he consent? What would consent look like? Were we sure that he was in a place where he could do that? And the editors and the reporter on this story in Frontline, we all struggled with it. Well, if you go to our website, you can read an entire article laying out why we did what we did and how we fought our way through this. Another way to sort of pick up VD, or to, sorry, I shouldn't say pick up VD, to detect VD, not pick it up, is to look at how it's been documented. 
The modern technology that allows us to hyperlink to everything is, of course, hard at work undermining the integrity of our efforts at transparency. Increasingly, and this is going to be a big problem, advances in artificial intelligence allow the creation of what are called deep fakes. Videos that can be fabricated to show people saying things they never said, yet look so re realistic that even a careful viewer can't tell. This is far, far more than the choppy editing of sound bites that we've seen in the past, where people take a tape and put a few words together and try to make it look like somebody said something they didn't say, and you look at it and go, yeah, right. This is good stuff. The deep fakes are convincing, they're getting better every day, so just because you hear it or see it doesn't mean it's true. So one of the things that I like to do is see when something is reported, who else is reporting it? In a sense, this is back to the future. We have a tradition in American journalism that's really 50 to 75 years old um, that says, we in the media are trying to present as best as we possibly can a fair, objective account. Arguably, we would like to think, you know, you could go out and buy the New York Times or read an Associated Press story and get the full story. It was certainly not ever thus. Back in the day, there were a lot of newspapers, and if you really wanted to be informed, you had to buy a bunch of them. It was accepted, frankly, that most newspapers had, had a political slam, and they would tell you the news that they cared about from their perspective. In Europe, just by the way, this has mostly never changed, and until recently it was pretty usual if you're in a European city and you stood by a news kiosk and watched people's news habits, okay, I do some boring things on vacation, um, you would see people come up and buy two or three papers, and they would be from a very different perspective, and that was how people kind of got to the truth. And these days, I think we probably need to get back to that. The notion of being objective remains, I think, core to the news media. We can certainly talk about this. I know people will probably want to ask about it. I still believe in it. Which is different, by the way, from saying that a reporter must never have any biases. Biases, meaning viewpoints, meaning a perspective on life. I don't think that's possible for human beings. We all have views. My expectation as an editor, if you come to work for me as a reporter, is that you will have views, but that you will put them aside when you come to work and to write and to discover and to report and to tell a story in the best way that the evidence dictates, not what you think it should be. And that's a hard thing to do. That's what the professional training of journalists is about, we hope. These days, though, as much as anybody might be trying to be objective, I believe it's essential for all of us as readers to get out of our bubbles and see what is being reported by news sites with all kinds of perspectives. We need to look beyond everything. We need to look beyond things with which we're just simply comfortable. True, I would argue, almost always end up being ultimately confirmed and expanded upon by other reporters. A friend of mine, when I worked in the New York Times Washington Bureau, used to have a saying about something that we were afraid would happen to one of our stories. We called it an eternal exclusive. Exclusive means a story only one organization has. Now, as a reporter, to use another old school term, you want to get the scoop, but you also, the next day or two, want to see lots of your competitors confirm it, go beyond it, expand on it. You never want to have a story that is so exclusive, no one else on earth can confirm it was true, because that raises the possibility it might not be true. Now the other day, BuzzFeed, which has done some very good work in the last few years, reported that Michael Cohen had told the special prosecutor Mueller that he'd been ordered to lie to Congress by the president, and that there was Trump organization internal documents to back the whole thing up. And the entire news media went boom, wow. That's a big story, as I like to say, if true. Unfortunately, later that day, the special counsel's office issued a carefully worded denial suggesting that something was wrong in the account. But to me, more importantly than the denial, because denials can be worded all sorts of ways, is that none of the very good reporters who cover this story at the Post and the LA Times and the New York Times and so on were able to confirm it. Now, it may yet turn out that the BuzzFeed error, if it was an error, was less significant than the prosecutor's statement might lead us to believe. 
Maybe Cohen told his tale to prosecutors in the Southern District of New York, not Mueller. Maybe the instruction he described was vaguer than reported, though still concerning. Saying, will someone rid me of this troublesome priest, can be a troubling thing for a leader to say if the priest ends up dead. I don't know. Nobody does. But my first instinct when the story came out was to scour the web and to see what everybody else was saying. And I think that's a useful start. Finally, I'd like to spend a few minutes reflecting on what we in the media can do more to combat the current climate in which large swaths of, public, of the public distrust reporters. And I think one thing that we need to do is be honest with readers and be honest with the public. It's one of the reasons I'm willing to get on an airplane in Newark, New Jersey and come to Fresno and, and talk to you all because I think we need to do more of this. Um, this is actually a tough job, being a reporter. It was a tough job when I started in the 1980s, and it's gotten way harder since then. The demands of social media and the desire for instant posting of complicated stories make mistakes more likely, not less. Many years ago, I had the great honor and pleasure of being in the New York Times Washington Bureau when they hired a four-star retired Marine Corps general, Mick Trainer, to be the chief military correspondent. And Mick was a great guy. He had been a, 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 an officer in Vietnam, he'd been the commandant of the Marine Corps, and he ended his career as the number two guy in the Marine Corps, which made, meant he was one of the eight people who are allowed into what is called the tank, where the Joint Chiefs of Staff and their deputies, those eight people, meet to discuss the most secret, most important things. And one day, after about six months of sitting behind me, Mick looked over at me and he just kind of, kind of wryly said, you know, when we were in the tank, we were talking about all the mistakes that you guys in the press make about the military. I just figured you were all lazy. He said, sitting next to you these past few months, watching you work the phone, seeing you here every night till 10 o'clock, I had no idea how hard you guys worked to get it that wrong. <laughs> so I'm here to be honest with you. Reporters are on the outside looking in. We get little tiny shards of the picture. We figure things out as we go along. People mislead us. Sometimes we're not smart enough to get it the first time. Sometimes we don't have a good sense of who's lying and who's spinning and who's telling the truth. So in addition to being transparent, I think we need to be more forthright in acknowledging errors. To be sure those who implacably don't trust us will simply use what we acknowledge as our mistakes as weapons against us. But I think that's a chance we have to take. I believe there is a great convincible middle in America still, and I think that there are still a great many of our fellow citizens for whom honesty about mistakes will build confidence, not undermine it. Last year at ProPublica, we discovered that we had made an egregious error on a story. We had reported in 2017 that the number two person in the CIA, Gina Haskell, had been involved in the infamous waterboarding of a man uh, named Abu Zubaydah, who was perceived incorrectly to be a senior member of Al-Qaeda, but actually wasn't. In fact, they kept waterboarding him because he wouldn't admit he was a senior member of Al-Qaeda, because he wasn't. Anyway, it would turn out that Haskell had been at a CIA dark site in Thailand directing the waterboarding of a suspect, but not that suspect. We had gotten it wrong, and no one, at the time the story was published, not the CIA, not her former colleagues, had ever told us so. But when Gina Haspel was nominated to be the director of Central Intelligence, our story became, began to be recycled all over the internet, and people started saying she waterboarded Abu Zubaydah, which was an infamous series of instances in the history of the intelligence community. And then we found out, as people began to come forward at that point, that we had gotten it wrong. When we were certain it was wrong, we published a 986-word explanation of exactly what we got wrong, why it mattered, how we had made the mistake, and we apologized, and by we, I mean me, the editor-in-chief, because I wrote it, we apologized to Gina Haspel for saying something about her that was untrue. Now, some of my journalist friends thought that was a, a fairly out there thing to do, but I'm here to tell you the world is still spinning on its axis. The sun's still rising, you know, every day, and actually, in doing follow-up stories on this subject, one of the key people we talked to, who had been one of Gina Haspel's closest friends, 
agreed to talk to ProPublica and ProPublica alone about the whole thing and provided important information additional because he felt that we had handled the correction with a level of class and honesty that he hadn't seen before. Now, none of this is going to solve everything, but I do think straight talk from the media about our fallibility would be a good start. Today, to close with some new news, the Columbia Journalism Review came out with an online poll about trust in journalists. And it does echo a lot of things that previous surveys have found that the trust of journalists is falling, as we know. Uh, journalists rate uh, a bit above Congress. Um, I think we're above used car salesmen, but it's, it's not great. Um, but there was some stuff in this poll that did stagger me. And it's an online poll, so I don't personally trust them, but take this for what it's worth. Fully 60% of the people who answered this poll, and that would be 54% of Democrats, 70% of Republicans, believe that reporters get paid by their sources sometimes or often to write stories. And I can assure you that is not true, but it's staggering that a majority of Americans believe that money is changing hands. And in fact, I mean, the great scandal in the news media, just to tell you, is what we talk about is money going in the other direction, where we're paying sources, which actually does very, very occasionally happen with, say, the National Enquirer, but is considered a firing offense of any, any sort of credible newspaper. But this is most Americans believe it's going in the other direction, that we are being paid to write what we write. A great number of Americans um, agreed with the following statement. The mainstream media is more interested in making money than telling the truth. Now, looking at my colleague from the Fresno Bee, I would say if that's the truth, uh, we're doing a lousy job of making money. We are a total failure, so maybe we should try another approach. Finally, only 10% of Republicans surveyed, and remember the country is you know, about 40% Democrat, 20% independent, 40% Republican, so 10, only 10% 10 of Republicans surveyed believe the media does not have a partisan bias. 31% of those surveyed believe the 31% of those surveyed who believe the country is going the right way have confidence in the press, 31%. Compared with 56% of those who think it's going the wrong way, they have confidence with the press. Now these are sobering numbers. And I have to say, reading them, it reminds me of myself as a younger reporter. You're going to say, what is he talking about? As a younger reporter, I would write a story, and I would be certain it was really, really good. And I would give it to my editors, and they would look at it, and they would completely misunderstand what I was saying. And my reaction was, well, they just idiots. I mean, it's, it's so clear. It's right. They would say, are you trying to say this? And I'd say, sure, it's right there. And I would point at a sentence, and they would shake their heads. I think in the media, if we're honest about this, we have to acknowledge that if a very, very large number of people hold these views and aren't getting the brilliance of what we're doing, um, maybe we're not expressing ourselves very well, and maybe we need to do a lot more to explain what we do and to be clear. Because, you know, just as that young reporter, now that I'm an editor and I have young reporters telling me this, now I look back and know, no, it wasn't that clear. Um, and if it were, intelligent people wouldn't have read it and felt otherwise. To be sure, the forces driving us apart, the Russian bots, the political hate that any politician can make out of attacking the media, the fact that multiple news outlets uh, are using, I think, being one-sided as uh, a business model. These are vast problems. But there are things we can do. I've suggested a few. Um, and I think the most important thing we can do is take questions. So I'd like to do a little of that. Um, and I'm sure there'll be some. Right here, do we have a mic? Um, yeah, I heard on National Public Radio a pretty disturbing uh, story. It's about uh, Justice Clarence Thomas, who has talked about uh, revisiting the uh, Sullivan versus Alabama case that is about a uh, press libel. I'm wondering if you can uh, comment on that. Uh, do you think the Supreme Court will overturn the ruling? And um, if they do, uh, what impact is it going to have on uh, the news media? Well, you know, when I started to write this speech, I had just given another speech on this subject. So um, I'll try not to be like that little doll where you pull the string and you get a long answer, but it, g give me a few minutes here. So um, yes, uh, what we're talking about, the question was about the very important Supreme Court ruling in the case called Times v. Sullivan. So let me give you a little bit of background on that. That's a case which came up during the Civil Rights era 
uh, civil rights groups would take out advertisements in newspapers like the New York Times attacking the sheriffs in Alabama in particular uh, for various kinds of misconduct, and libel suits would then be brought against the people who took the ads out. And so this gets to the Supreme Court, and the Supreme Court issues a very, very important ruling, because they answer the question, what is libel? And they do something in this country that is not done in other countries. They say that if the press gets something wrong about what is called a public figure, you know, a, a senator, a, a president, you know, whatever, that the standard will be, is there something called actual malice? What does that mean? It means, was the press either in reckless disregard of the truth, they moved so quickly, they didn't call, they didn't check, they didn't do any of the most obvious things that their mistake was caused by their recklessness? Or did they have in their head knowledge that what they were writing was untrue, the deliberate telling of an untruth? That is a very high standard, and it has allowed newspapers to pursue stories about public figures with a great deal of vigor without having to worry about being sued for libel. In most countries, it's not like that. In Britain, basically, a politician can sue for libel over any mistake, and so the press is very nervous about writing about powerful people. I was the investigative editor of the New York Times when our correspondents in Mexico, who were writing about drug dealing by members of the government in the New York Times, were charged criminally with libel under Mexican law, criminal libel. And I said to our lawyer, what is the standard of proof in Mexico for, what's the deal? What do, what do they have to prove to put our, put our guys in jail? And he looked it up and he said, the law says any publication that offends the dignity of a politician is a crime. So we in America live in a uh, place where we have the First Amendment, and the First Amendment as interpreted in this case is extremely broad in allowing sort of investigation and probing and prodding of public figures. And so Clarence Thomas saying perhaps the court needs to rethink this is saying, and I don't think there's any great support for this in the universe at the moment of legal scholarship, but who knows, um, if you were to undo these protections, you would fundamentally change the ability of the press to pursue stories about uh, important public figures, businessmen, and so on, and it would be an extremely uh, significant change. One other thing I will say, because I had to give this whole speech about this, um, people think that First Amendment law is something that's existed since, you know, Thomas Jefferson. That's not true. The first big, we're now in the 100th anniversary of the first Supreme Court decisions on the First Amendment, and they were in 1919. And they were the worst decisions you have ever heard. In 1917, the Congress had said, um, if you say anything that undermines our war effort in World War I, that's a crime. Because we're like, you know, we're in trouble here. We're in a war, and we can't have people like, you know, loose lips. And so people were prosecuted. Three different people were prosecuted, three different Supreme Court cases. One guy sent leaflets to people who might sign up for the draft, saying, don't go to the draft. Another guy published a language, German language newspaper saying the war might not be such a good idea. And a third guy, a presidential candidate, Eugene V. Debs, a socialist, gave a speech saying, I know they charged those other guys, but I still think the war is a bad idea. They charged him too. They actually put him in jail, and the Supreme Court 9-0 ruled that it was within the Constitution and First Amendment for Congress to ban free speech about the war. Eugene V. Debs did not get out of jail until that noted First Amendment hero Warren G. Harding and let him go. But I digress. Next question. Yes, sir. Hopefully a microphone is coming your way. Hang, hang tight. The president is always threatening to sue. And even the early stages of a libel case, very expensive. I'm an ex-editor. Um, but is there ever a time that you hope to go forward with the suit so that you can depose him? And get an answer. <laughs> And if you did have that shot at him, what would be your first question? <laughs> you know, I, 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 have, uh, I have no idea what the first question um, would be in a situation like that, but I will tell you this, 
um, you know, as people uh, have scoured the, the record for depositions of the president while a businessman, and I, he um, does threaten to file suits. He very seldom goes through, and he has had a few depositions, and if you go back and read them, I think you can see why he doesn't like to go through with his suits. Um, it's not a good idea, and, and I don't think he ever will file a suit against anybody for libel. Not going to happen. But to your other point, um, even in this sort of Garden of Eden of Times v. Sullivan and protection and actual malice that I mentioned, even with all of that, you're absolutely right. Libel suits are very, very expensive. Um, we at ProPublica set aside hundreds of thousands of dollars every year in our budget that we don't spend, I hope, but actually we have spent a couple of times for people who sue us. And even the most preliminary work on a completely frivolous libel suit is thirty to fifty thousand dollars, and it goes up from there. So that's a lot of money. And and at the Fresno Bee, uh, that's got to be that's got to hurt if you get sued, even if it's frivolous. Further questions? Uh, down in front here, or in the back. In Russia, Turkey, other dictatorial countries. They don't bother with the First Amendment, they just arrest, assassinate, or whatever. Um, it seems to me Trump is doing what he can without violating the First Amendment uh, to get the dress to be unbelieved by a majority of Americans. Uh, am I overstating that? And if Roger Ailes was still alive, would he be proud of what he has accomplished? Well, I certainly don't want to speak for Roger Ailes. <laughs> but let's be clear about something. I mean, I think the, what you said is certainly a, a valid way of an, analyzing it. But, you know, and, and, and I, I understand there are some left-wing critiques of what I'm about to say that would disagree with me. But I think the very First Amendment that um, we're talking about gives the president and other politicians uh, an unchallenged, an unchallengeable right to do exactly what he wants. And, you know, the idea, uh, First Amendment scholars talk about the notion that why do we have a First Amendment? We believe, at the end of the day, that a robust conversation, in, in a robust conversation, good ideas will crowd out bad ideas. Now, that's a little bit idealistic. I think social science research suggests that actually getting anyone, your spouse, your brother or sister, um, people who read your stories to change a fundamental opinion they have is no mean feat. I think people tend to stay in the lanes that they're comfortable. Um, but the Republic is founded on the nation that people get to say what they want. And, you know, I mean, it's, this is not a new thing. Uh, Spiro Agnew famously, you know, did a lot of attacks on the press, uh, referred to us as, uh, I love this, nattering nabobs of negativity. That was us. Um, a phrase, by the way, not written by Spiro Agnew, but by Bill Sapphire, um, who was quite a good writer and later became a columnist for the New York Times, so go figure. And the whole Agnew thing came to an end when it was eventually proven that he was accepting duffel bags of cash in the White House as bribes that were being paid for his previous job as governor of Maryland. So, you know, what goes around comes around. I think there was a question in the front, if I, I couldn't possibly have answered it, um, or in the back, I don't know, whatever. I think it's one of the, okay. Well, I'll get you. Go ahead. Oh, hi. Um, you said, what year was that first poll taken when you said 76% of the people believe the media? Was that in the 70s? Tim, what year was that? That was 76. 76. That was 72% believe. Yeah. Okay, so has the poll been taken every year and has it steadily decreased? Yes. And it, it's it kind of a little bounce up very recently. I think since Trump took office, it, it, the low point was 34%. And now it's up to 40 bucks. But I don't know if that's going to happen. I was just wondering, since he got into office, that he really got bad. Because to me, it seems like it depends who you listen, which news source you listen to. I mean, I don't believe Fox at all. <laughs> well, I think that's things, just my, you know, get my bias. I mean, I think things have changed, and in some ways for the better, in some ways for the worst. I mean, there was a period of history. Um, people of a certain age, myself included, remember it, where there were only three channels, and, you know, essentially, Walter Cronkite, you know, was watched by 30 million people, and, you know, Lyndon Johnson famously said, after Cronkite went to Vietnam and came back with a very pessimistic story, if I've lost Cronkite, I've lost America. I don't think there's any such centralized 
news source anymore. We all have all these options. In many ways, that's a good thing. You know, I mean, we've, we have a much more diverse choice of, of viewpoints, uh, diverse backgrounds. I mean, this democratization of the media, you know, has brought with it downsides, um, but also some significant improvements. So I think, you know, but we're, never, we're not going back to those days. I, I don't think there's going to be one person you lose in the media, and that's, that's the end of it. So. How about down here? Because this gentleman I know has had his hand up, and I keep pointing, and nothing happens, so let's do it. If you could make a request of Facebook's Mark Zuckerberg, what would it be? Uh, that's a great question. Did everybody hear the question? If we could make a request of Mark Zuckerberg, what would it be? Um, that is an extremely good and complicated question because Facebook is a platform, and Facebook makes its money several different ways, one of which is by finding out an enormous amount of personal information about you and then selling it to advertisers who want to reach you. But one of the other ways it makes money is that it's very easy to get on Facebook and to circulate things on Facebook. And their perspective is, we're not publishers, we're a platform. We're not going to edit the way the Fresno Bee or ProPublica, the Los Angeles Times, Washington Post, every story is edited carefully, checked and so on. We're just going to let people put things up there. That's our business model. And so we've now seen a tremendous amount of manipulation on that. So. Here's a request I'm not making. I don't want Mark Zuckerberg as, as the world's editor. I don't want him editing everything. Um, I'm very worried about any attempts by Facebook or these big platforms um, to come up with ways to filter what's on there. Um, I do think a couple of things would be helpful. You know, it might be nice if they could verify the identities of people, and if you write down St. Petersburg GRU major, that maybe there's some attention paid, I don't know. Um, so maybe we could try to get some of the fake names and fake stuff off. Um, but I think that this is a conundrum um, that is not going to be easily solved. And when they talk about what they call content moderation, and they say it's all going to be AI, we're going to write a computer program that's going to filter out the bad stuff and leave the good stuff, it makes me very, very nervous. I will tell you that as a person in the media, Facebook first response to all of this controversy was to simply dial down the distribution of news. Just forget it. News bad. Puppy pictures good, news bad. Um, that had a significant effect on a lot of news outlets. I mean, our traffic, even at ProPublica, and we were not Facebook heavy, our traffic was down about 20, 25% as a result of this, and we've had to go out and find more readers through other means. So I am not necessarily excited to see um, Facebook, you know, deciding what's news, deciding what's good, deciding what should circulate. Um, so I, I don't have an answer, but it is an extremely important part of this question. One more. How about in the back here? Yes, well, my name is Earl White, and I'm a tech. And I wonder if there's a possible way to um, use antivirus to filter out the news, maybe to port 119, which is like a dedicated port for, um, uh, I think, news networks and stuff like that. Explain to me how it would work. I mean, I, I get the idea. How, how would you filter the news to make sure it was authentic, so to say? Well, when you take the port 119, and anything that comes through there would be, um, I guess, for like a panel of uh, media to uh, say if that's fake news or not fake news. So you have a, um, you know, peers saying that, you know, maybe like you said, Facebook. If the story not for Facebook, it's not come through that port if you treat it as a virus. And you in the virus program, we're not allowed to through um, that port. It's like certifying news. Yeah, a lot of people are talking about this. Can we come up with a, uh, a panel that can sort of certify what's true? And it would be, I suppose, great, but just close your eyes and try and imagine who's supposed to be on that panel and who gets to decide and what's real and what isn't. Um, and, you know, as a First Amendment uh, sort of advocate, you know, I think the founders had it basically right. The founders, you know, remember the way that reads, Congress shall make no law. They were really, really clear. They did not think anybody should be telling people what to read. And I think, you know, even in this technical era where we may be able to filter things, it makes me very nervous about who the censors would be. Because let's be clear, we, are sen we would be censoring at that point. So um, I'm afraid the current mess may be one that we're going to have to be in for a while longer. Thank you very much, and I guess there's more to come.
Great, well thank you. Uh, we had a great uh, keynote speech, now we have a great panel. So I'm uh, Jim Boren, I'm the Executive Director of the Fresno State Institute for Media and Public Trust, and so thank you for this opportunity to introduce our panel of these acclaimed journalists and talk a bit about the Fresno State Institute. We started the Institute in June after I retired, retired as editor of the Fresno Bee. My goal was to find a way to improve media literacy uh, in the San Joaquin Valley, offer strategies to identify fake news, and to look for ways to bridge the trust gap between media outlets and news consumers. Our concept was quickly embraced by the community, which confirmed to me the need for our work. Here are a few things we've already done. We've worked with the Fresno County Office of Education to develop a media literacy module for high school reading and composition students. We've developed a list of protocols for identif identifying fake news. We've worked with media outlets to improve trust through transparency and offered a list of things that media outlets can do right now to rebuild trust with the public. In addition, we've held programs on the First Amendment, free speech issues on college campuses, and newsroom ethics. And on April 9th, we will explore the challenge of journalists covering science and environmental issues in an era of mistrust. We hope you can come out for that program also. We'll have some of the best science journalists in the country coming to this session, as well as a scientist to give the point of view, that, that point of view of the media coverage of science issues. All of our work will be guided by the First Amendment. We believe strongly that a well-informed citizenry will improve civic engagement and participation in our democracy. We will talking, we'll be talking a lot about ethics, values, and transparency as we look for solutions to the mistrust that is so prevalent today in all of our institutions. We will be seeking common ground as we look for ways to bridge the trust gap. We hope you join us in that quest. We will need all your help to solve the problems we face. So now let's turn to our panel of journalists. Let's start with Sewell Chan. Sewell is the deputy managing editor of the Los Angeles Times in the far left next to Tim. Um, he currently oversees the news desk, copy desk, audience engagement desk, and the data desk. Before coming to Los Angeles, he worked for 14 years at the New York Times, serving as a Metro reporter, Washington correspondent, deputy op-ed editor, and international news editor. He was part of a team awarded the Pulitzer Prize for its coverage of the scandal that brought down Governor Elliot Spitzer of New York. Chan began his career as a reporter at the Washington Post in 2000. Next to uh, Sewell is uh, Julia Williams. She's the Northern California news editor for the Associated Press. Julia oversees a regional team of reporters who cover a wide range of topics, including last fall's wildfires in paradise. She was named news editor after serving 12 years in the AP Sacramento Bureau, including two years as a correspondent. She previously spent five years as a reporter for the Associated Press in Milwaukee. She is a member of the board of the First Amendment Coalition and a past president of the Sacramento Press Club. And then we have Scott Wilson, senior national correspondent for the Washington Post. As a senior national correspondent, Scott covers <clears throat> California and the West. He previously served as the Post national editor, chief, of, chief White House correspondent, deputy assistant managing editor for Foreign News, and as a correspondent in Latin America and the Middle East. He has received an Overseas Press Club citation and an Inter Inter um, Inter-American Press Association Award, the Gerald R. Ford uh, Prize for Distinguished Reporting on the Presidency, and the White House Correspondents Association 2012 Aldo Beckman Award. So well, let's welcome our uh, panel of journalists, and uh, the Roger Chair and Chair uh, Tim Drackwist will be our moderator. Thank you, Tim. So let's get going. Um, I want to start, in my intro remarks, I, I mentioned this 27-point trust gap between uh, 1976 and today. What can we do? So, Julian, let's start with you. What can we do to kind of bridge the, make this number go higher? I'll solve all of journalism's problems <laughs> right here. Um, well, thank you for having us. Um, well, I think we got at some of the issues um, in Stephen's talk. We can start by being more transparent about what we do and by educating people about what we do. 
what we do. I think um, some of the things that Jim was talking about, about education, is a very critical step because we need more informed news consumers. We need um, young people who understand the news ecosystem, and especially with the, the rise of filtering programs like what Facebook does, um, we need people to understand the difference between good journalism and things that are made up. I don't want to use the term fake news because I'm banishing it from my vocabulary anyway. Um, you know, I think a lot of people don't even know that the news that they are seeing has been filtered for them, um, especially on platforms like Facebook. They don't even realize that what they are seeing has been tailored to them. Once you click on one site, then you're getting fed up more things that are, are tailored to you that are what you believe. So we need good news consumers, and some of that starts with transparency and talking about how we do our reporting, showing more of the data that we do. Um, the Associated Press, like most of the news organizations here, um, has started distributing a lot more data. We've always, um, since, data journal since we started all doing more data journalism, we've distributed data sets to our, to our customers and our members for them to do local stories. Now we put it up for everyone to use, to look at how this affects you in your own communities, that kind of thing. Um, and I think that we can do it by writing good stories that reflect our communities. When people see themselves in news, then they understand what the journalism that we're doing means to them. Um, and, and good storytelling is still the core of journalism. We want to expose and, um, and make change, but the, the reason is because it affects people. People who live where you live, people who live everywhere. Um, and so you need to see yourself reflected in those stories for it to matter to you, for you to want to click on those stories. I do Elaborate? What would you do? Not much different than that. I mean, I, you know, and I, I, I don't, I hope it helps. Um, I think, I think a lot of the big news organizations that, that we represent are aggressive about posting original documents, uh, sound, pictures, obviously. Um, it, we, uh, when we were in the 26, during the 2016 campaign, we actually, um, we did a, a Trump book in real time. Uh, we put 20 reporters from across the newsroom together, assigned two of them to each chapter, uh, and kind of did it backwards from how you usually do it. Usually you cover a story and then you sign a book contract and write a book about it. This was, we were reporting the book and publishing as we learned things from the book. This was, under agreement with the publisher and all that. But what we did afterwards is uh, the book came out and the, the next day, every, all of our reporting, um, raw, all the court filings, all the interview transcripts, everything we put online um, in, uh, in, in a special module that said, you know, this is for other researchers, it's for, you know, you can see how we did the work, but you can also use it um, and to try to gain some gain trust and, and show that we were trying to be as transparent as possible about it. it. The idea received a lot of resistance, not from more senior editors, but from the reporters themselves, who I think initially you, you do feel like, wait, people are gonna see me naked or something, you know, and, and you, you realize it's just your interview. I mean, it's fascinating. People are gonna wanna read that, and they're gonna wanna see that. And everyone was great about it towards the end, but it did take some uh, cultural change, professional, you know, the way you think about your work and, and especially a lot of the investigative reporters who are on it who tend to be people who are extremely careful uh, and, and protective of their work. Uh, and we sort of had to teach them that it wasn't about being protective, it was about trying to be transparent. Anyway, I, a, a lot of people applauded that, but it's a small thing and it needs to happen with every story. I was fascinated to hear what the bee's doing. I think that's a great idea. And I, I don't see why we're not doing something like that. Um, I don't see any risk in that. Um, and it, it seems smart, and I think it would generate a lot of goodwill. Just to follow up on that real fast, because I was amazed. So how much extra time did it require to get all those notes online? You're delaying publication a little bit, kind of, to get all this all together. Right? Yeah, so um, we, what we did, we kind of split the difference, right? So we were, this is a shared enterprise, right? So we had a Dropbox thing with all of our Trump work in it, chapter by chapter. People, reporters would just share their work into that and there were 25 of us who had access to it. So it was electronic already. Um, uh, but then, to your point, you know, when we started talking about the months before the book came out with tech people on how we could do this, 
Um, they said that the, the task is enormous. I mean, it's huge. And we just finally said, look, let's, it can be wrong. It can be, you know, it doesn't have to be as user friendly as everything we do. Um, but let's make sure that people can see it if they want to see it. And it wasn't complicated, it was folders, basically, um, with some guidance and years and, and categories. Um, but it wasn't an elaborate, graphically designed thing. It was more like, here's our archive, have at it. Uh, uh, so, so, what's your solution here? This is a brief answer, and I agree with what Julia and Scott have said. Um, I would try to step back from apologies. Is this clear? I think you have to look at the crisis of trust in America as extending beyond the press. There is a. <laughs> I'm really sorry. <laughs> is this working? Too far? I think it's out. I became that person who does this. <laughs> <laughs> Is it clear now? Is there any app? But how do we go from like deafening noise to <laughs> Sorry about that. Um, I think we have to look at the decline in trust across many institutions and sectors of American life. Trust in, in even the military is declining. Trust in the judiciary and judges is declining. Trust in... Please speak into the microphone. I am now. Sorry about that. Can't seem to get this right. Trust in um, the professions is declining. Even trust in universities is declining. So we sort of have to look at the crisis of trust in American life. Um, I would say that these problems of trust and mistrust long predate the current political moment. They really go back decades. They relate to things like the, ri the rising inequality in American life. They relate to things like the urban rural divide, which is one of the most important um, political divisions currently. Um, I'm going to stop talking just so you can try to get this right. <laughs> Okay. Um, well, 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 I'll go on then. Because um, I want to go into the weeds here, and some of these questions are heavily weed oriented, but not, don't, okay. <laughs> Watch it when it's like a VD conversation. All right, here's what I mean. Um, there are a lot of, of, of confusion, there always has been confusion traditionally, uh, when readers look at the story, the distinguishing between an opinion piece and a new story, a story that's written uh, based on the facts that we, that we have. Um, there's a perception problem that will occur. So what, what, that if you're in your paper, you have a opinion piece on page 16, and you have a new story on page 3, written by the same organization, what does that, what does that do? And I want to take a step further, and I'm going to start with Scott on this one, Scott has a very interesting publication. I mean, it has a very interesting way it handles this in a certain sense. And I don't know if any of you have been to the Washington Post website. It's a great website. And what it does is it'll have a news story. And it'll give you the, 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 big, the big story. And then often, as a sidebar headline to it, it'll have an opinion piece. So further, if I'm looking at one spot, I see a news story and I see an opinion story. But are we creating a problem for readers by do they tell the difference? Should we keep doing this? I would say a couple of things. Well, one thing that I, I really, I, I do think that, that the burden of, of fixing this trust gap is on the media. I do think also that readers really have to take responsibility for what they're reading and what they're seeing and, and how to understand it, especially when it's there before them to be understood. So now that's not to say that, that the steps that we've tried to take have clarified everything for people. And I think the virtual world that most people are, are now getting their news from makes it extremely difficult to figure out what you're getting at every tip. Link comes over Twitter, it's not, gonna, it's not shouting out opinion or it's not. And, um, and, and so back in the days when it was a, a newspaper, you had news, then suddenly you were on something that looked totally different and it was the opinion page and it had who the, you know, the, the masthead and all this, and, and it, was, it was simpler in that way. Still confused people, why, why are you so against the president when, you know, in your news story you said this was a great idea, or, or it seemed to suggest that, quoting people saying that. I, 
when I look at the Washington Post website, so we, we've gone to three categories, right? We did this two years ago, I think, talking a lot with, with some of the social media platforms as well, when they were trying to, to kind of get news literacy, uh, crank up their game on news literacy. We have news, we have perspective, and we have opinion. Now, it's a kind of a fine line in some of those, right? So, perspective piece is basically a news analysis. Um, no one understood what news analysis meant either. It's not like, you know, that was something that everyone, oh, now I get it. Um, opinion is just opinion. So, those are the, we didn't want to do five, we were going to do ten, because we were baffling people with all these different, you know, terms we had that we were just kind of making up as we went along, it seemed like sometimes. Um, so that's what we've done. We've gone to three things. At the same time, if I click open the Washington Post website right now and see the home page, I, I can forgive people who are sort of brushed back by the amount of, by the volume of Trump news, uh, headlines that are screaming out things about Trump. Many of them negative, I'm not saying they're wrong, I'm just, it's capturing what's happening. But it can feel a little overwhelming and, and a little bit, this place is not. Now, they say, most people don't read their news from the homepage. They get it in other ways, so it's not that big a deal. It's not like editing the front page. Look at our front page. It's much more sober, balanced, and, you know. So, I, you know, I think it's a challenge. I think we have to, I don't think we can use that excuse anymore. I think we have to say people are going to come to us on a whole bunch of different platforms in different ways. And if, if each, if we're not editing, those platforms in ways that people are going to find it fair and understandable, then then we're doing it wrong. Um, anyway, oh, as soon please, because the other time yeah. doesn't. And like an actual like Scott saying, you know, we're talking, we're having intense discussions right now as we think about redesigning and and, and off platform. I just want to note this distinction, right? One of the challenges for publishers is that our website and our mobile app is not the only form of distribution anymore. A lot of people find journalistic content through search. Search, search either Google or Bing is usually the largest driver of, of traffic, um, of, of page views. And then you've got all the social media platforms um, and then new ones that are coming like Snap, Instagram, YouTube. The number of platforms has almost outpaced, I think, A, the publisher's ability to keep up with the, the various means of distribution, but also B, the reader's ability to keep up with the information overload. And I think that's one thing we have to talk about. I'm very interested, for example, the phenomenon of news avoidance. There are people who feel that there's simply too much news, too much to pay attention to. And given that everyone, people, most, the average person is trying to take care of their family, go to work, get the kids to school, go about daily life. And what responsibility do we in the media have to help people navigate the sense of information overload? that is related to sensory overload, and it really transcends partisanship because it's about what is the role of media and information in an informed society. Yeah, I'll start with you on this one. Is, is there an argument to be made that maybe to help clarify things that we should stop writing opinion pieces? Just, come on, see you later. I mean, the AP doesn't do it now because you have no. a slightly different service. You're, you're... The AP doesn't write opinion pieces and has never written opinion pieces and it's actually very freeing as a reporter because yeah. um, you don't run into any um, people who are resistant to talk to you because they think that you're a conservative newspaper or a liberal newspaper or, you know, wrongly because the reporters who work for these institutions are, are not biased because of those, you know, but it is, it, it is, it does make things hard to navigate as a reporter. Uh, it is freeing. Um, we do write news analysis pieces which people get freaked out about because they say it's not our role. Um, but no, I think editorials by newspapers are still a fundamental part of discussion and discourse in our communities. Um, and, and I think that they serve an important role in that, in that sense of talking about issues and, and, and they're well researched. You know, I was talking about this with someone who doesn't really understand how this all comes to be and as I was preparing for this panel. Someone who, who isn't an informed news consumer, they care about news, but they don't understand how, how the sausage is made. Um, and, and, you know, people don't understand the amount of research and work that goes into writing an editorial. It's the same amount of work that goes into writing, reporting any other story. And the people who write editorials are, have long experience in the news business, and they are reporters. Many of them make calls and do the same kind of interviews. And there are people in our communities that want to have debates and discussions, and so 
um, it comes from an informed place, and I think that we would be we would all be for, we would all be less rich if we didn't have. Do we think that a typical reader, though, even knows what an editorial is versus an op-ed versus an no. essay versus a news analysis? No, but I and I think that that newspapers would be better served to write an explainer at the top saying, "Here's how we did the work on this," just like we were talking about with the other news. You know, here's all the people that I called, or, or so and so has been covering all these issues for 25 years, and you know, wanted to write about it because X, Y, Z, or a panel of five people debated this, and here's why we came to this conclusion. I think that people might engage with it more. We found just along those lines, one thing that, that as we were making those changes to the three categories, that we found a lot of people in the surveys wanted to know who we were. Why even news story opinion come doesn't matter. Who's writing the story, and why should I, why should I believe what literally, they're doing? But literally to the level of who are you? Well, so are you if you click on Where you my go? bio page now, it has like an embarrassing amount of information about who I am. I mean, in the sense of where I went to school, where I, you know, tons of that's all from this. That's all we were all required to do it. Um, and again, I don't, I haven't seen any anecdotal or or you know quantitative data that says people really like us a lot more now, but they, they really wanted to know who's writing a story and, and why should I, why should I believe what's in it. Now, just stay with me for a second. The talk about opinions, should we get rid of them? I mean, are, are they, I mean, I think we all agree it's a valuable part of journalism, but it does make your life hard. I've worked on both the opinion side of news and the, well, and the news side of news, and I don't think the issue is getting rid of because the internet, if anything, is full of opinion. Right? <laughs> opinion is relatively inexpensive to produce because we all have opinions. What's difficult is getting opinions that are well researched, supported by evidence, and advance logical, lucid arguments that are based on evidence, and that also take into account potential contrary points of view. That was the kind of, it sounds so like a high school civics class, but that is the standard I tried to adhere to during four and a half years working on the New York Times op-ed page, working with writers from um, Vladimir Putin to Angelina Jolie. And it, so there's a, there's a lot of interest in opinion. Um, I don't think that news sources should shy away from it. I do think labeling matters a lot. Um, I like the idea almost of nutrition labeling, where we say very clearly who we are, what our institutions are. The Minneapolis Star Tribune literally talks even about its ownership structure. We're a locally owned newspaper since what year? You know what what the institution's history has been and who our journalists are. And I think we start from there. The New York Times editorial board does the same. Now. It says what an editorial board is, how the board arrives at its decisions, who it reports to, and what it represents. There are you know, websites, not like right here, that that will characterize the Washington Post, the the, the, the LA Times, New York Times as center left or left. You guys, when you're doing a news story, aren't center. That, yet there's this that it's because of those opinion pieces that they make these classifications. I'd only say that that, that this predates this predates the internet, right? I mean, in, in some ways, I think this line of conversation could almost we could have almost had it 15 years ago. Um, you know, I've worked at the Post for 22 years, and no one, you know, people think we're a left-wing newspaper long before we were distributed online. Um, I said, well, we, you know, we supported the, the invasion of Iraq. Oh, well, I mean, I don't know, but you know. So there's, it, you get the idea, and I'm not, again, I'm not, people can't stay up, right, they can't stay up with all of it. Um, but it's, I don't think that's unique to our time. But can I also just challenge the question a little bit? It's not, I would just argue against thinking about things only in terms of left-right ideology, because that's the framing for so much of American discourse these days. But I think in addition to ideology, I think some readers are justifiably asking whether our newsrooms are diverse enough, whether they, we, right, whether they represent the half of humanity that's female, the increasing share of our population that is Latino, Asian, African American, whether we represent rural Americans, people who've served in the military, Americans of religious faith. I think the bigger challenge that I find as someone who's trying to hire journalists to the LA Times is not so much left-right ideology, which is a subject that rarely comes up, 
and it's not even the subject of racial and ethnic diversity, which also comes up and is very important. But I would argue there's something more subtle there. We're looking for a balance of people who went to state schools, community colleges, um, as well as prestigious private schools. We're looking at, for people with class diversity, people who've done manual labor for a living or come from families that have. I think there's a disconnection also between the perception of coastal elites and, um, and inland areas of our country. I think there's a real, again, rural-urban disconnect in America. There's a secular and religious disconnect. And increasingly, readers are asking, what are our assumptions? Not so much in terms of, you know, ideology and political party, because that's the easier step. But more subtle, in a way, is asking, do our newsrooms reflect the complexity and heterogeneity of our societies? And again, I think a step toward that, because we're not going to fix it right away, is being very honest about who we are personally and who our institutions are. And, and because of those shortcomings, what are the stories that we are not telling as much as the stories that we are telling? So, both of, all of you, three of you, have hit on social media in one way or another. So, I, in some opinion land, I got to go to one more step, one more spot, which is social media. Uh, and I'm going to start with Scott on this one because you're a reporter right now. So, you write a story, you're going to tweet about it. Um, but there's a lot of reporters out there, there's a lot of editors out there, um, who consciously give their opinions about things uh, in the Twitter world, in the Facebook world. Does that hurt your credibility when you are giving your opinion about something? And does it hurt your organization's credibility? Absolutely. I mean, there's, there's no doubt about it. We have, um, you know, pretty strict um, policies about what you can and cannot do. I mean, I had, when I was national editor, I called up our reporters who were wandering around the country and saying, you can't say what you said on Twitter last night. And, uh, you know, and, and, how did they respond? Um, <laughs> fine, frankly. Um, it's Wyoming, it's the middle of the night, I just woke up and I saw this car on TV, I just had to say something about it. Like, don't <laughs> next time. <laughs> like, just don't. So, I, I, I think it's fine. I mean, I, my opinions on Twitter have nothing to do with what I'm writing about. Um, I've got a lot of opinions about professional soccer, which I share freely, to, and nobody cares. But um, but I'm not writing about how much I like or dislike Gavin Newsom. But and increasingly, everything you say and every utterance, I, I do believe that public life and private life are kind of, in some ways, breaking down. We can talk about whether that's good or bad, but there is a reality that we represent our institutions and our profession. And, you know, can you just a little talk about that? I mean, you, you are I mean, I, I think it goes to your point. I think it goes to your point of, you know, some of it can be seen in the light of this guy's a human being, and he's, you know, whether I, I think Barcelona is a great soccer team or I think he's crazy, they might feel more comfortable reading my work and understanding who I am and, and, and all that. So it, it's, it's a step done right. It's a step towards transparency about who you are. Um, and done wrong, it, 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 yeah, it, it absolutely undermines you. And um, again, not, not there's just so many more ways to get in trouble with it now. But it would have been, you know, 20 years ago, going on Meet the Press, and you're a White House correspondent. And, you know, you've got real problems with the president. Um, it, you just it would, it would hurt you. So, so Julia, you, you supervise a bunch of reporters in the AP Bureau in Northern California. Do you spend a lot of time on social media and Facebook watching it? Your reporters are tweeting out, or is this part of your job? Or? It's absolutely a part of my job. Um, for the most part, the reporters that I oversee, I, it's not a concern to me. But I certainly do look at what they what they do, post on social media, and if they did something um, wrong, I would do the same thing: tell them that they had to take it down, or that they can't tweet that. Um, we have a very stringent policy at Associated Press about what you can say and what you can't say, and it absolutely hurts your credibility as a journalist. Something that you cannot get back, I would add. I mean, there's nothing more important to a journalist than their credibility. Once you lose it, it takes much longer to get it back than it did to get it in the first place. Um, so, you know, you have to walk a very fine line, and it is challenging, but I do think that Places like Twitter and Facebook are an opportunity for us to engage with readers, and and you know, I have I gotten in um, social media arguments with people over things? Absolutely. They're not. I don't give my opinion. I was sort of having a debate with someone about some stuff about high speed rail, which I used to cover um, last week on Twitter, but I didn't cross over the line into giving my opinion about the project. It was, you know, specifics. You know, and, and, then, and then I stopped. Um, so social, 
Oh, you know, and, and I've definitely told um, interns, you know, before you come here and, and, and you're going to put your name on the Associate Press, you got to take down those pussy hat pictures of yourself on Instagram because now you work for the Associated Press. And that's not cool. And if you want to be a legitimate journalist, don't ever put anything up like that again because this is your profession now. And you can't go to those marches and be a participant if you want to be, work for a straight up news organization. So, Sewell, let me now put you on the spot. But this, so let's say the LA Times, there's, there's 10 reporters who keep repeatedly putting their opinions in tweets, bringing the credibility of the Times. Do you ban them? I mean, do you, would you favor a policy of thou shalt no longer be on Facebook and, and Twitter? Well, certainly, certainly in general, I don't think prohibitions work. I think what I do think works is guidelines and principles. We have very clear social media guidelines, like the Associated Press and the Washington Post. We have clear social, we have clear ethics policies regarding conflicts of interest. And we do need to regulate and look carefully at what people are doing online. I also want to note, though, that Social media can also be a very, very helpful way to connect with communities, can be, if it's done right. I think, like, when I, one of the things I try to do very much is look at good practices rather than bad ones. When people are using social media to identify how they found a story, the methods they used to research it, um, and how, like, in some cases, capturing photo and video, perhaps, especially if they're going to, you know, a really interesting community or part of the country or part of the world, it can be very illuminating. One of Scott's uh, colleagues, my, our friend uh, David Farringold, who won a Pulitzer Prize, took very um, careful notes. He, he literally screenshotted images of how he researched uh, donations to the Trump Foundation, and you know, kind of in a way, invited the audience, invited his readers in to look at his methods and his processes, including opening himself up to potential criticism of those methods. But in being very transparent about it, I think he helped build trust, and I think that was a very helpful use of social media. Uh, so I want to have one more opinion-related thing, and then a couple of one other thing I want to deal with. Uh, earlier this month, and I, uh, can, I, it's something that Steve brought up that I want to get back to, which is, yes, the history of journalism really is the history of, of writing from a point of view, and it's only in the last 50 to 70 years in which we've kind of forced this world of, of where we're, we want to be fair and balanced, and we're the best version, best available version of the truth. Um, so that. Along with that thought, there are a lot of partisan news organizations that are currently showing up. Uh, Frank Martin, just give me one right at the, right at the top. Uh, earlier this month, the Knight Commission on Trust in the Media and Democracy, which is online, and I would encourage most people if you want to read this uh, document, it's not too long, um, says, says, I'm going to quote this, so give me a second. The rise of partisan news organizations is producing more bias in news reports and increasingly blur the line between news and opinion and traditional mainstream, which, which in some lesser organizations has been happening, is contributing to perceptions of bias more generally. And says the, 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 the commission goes on to say that this, this blur of line significantly diminishes trust. So we've got partisan news organizations who are more vocal now than maybe they were uh, 10 or 15 years ago. We've also got this huge political divide and, and people yelling at each other across this huge chasm. And we've occasionally got this opinion showing up online or, or in print or, or in social media. Um, should we, and Steve also kind of went down this path a little bit, should we pay attention to more what we're reporting and maybe report a little less? Right, we have machines of outrage right now. And before we talk a little bit about, you know, I'm not here to cast blame on who started the outrage. But I think that part of our culture right now is a culture of feeding outrage, fueling outrage, and frankly getting clicks or getting audience views from outrage. And we have to move away from that. I also want to say that journalism, ha I want to put in a plug for an organization I'm not part of that, uh, that I admire called Solutions Journalism Network. They're part of this very big uh, landscape of nonprofit news organizations, and SJM focuses on programs and organizations that matter, that are actually doing things to help fix problems. Um, they, <coughs> so I, one thing I like about social, Solutions Journalism Network is it's not appealing just to people's virtue or a sense of you know just wanting to be a better person, which are important things in and of themselves. But it's actually looking at programs that have helped people. You know, there's a whole debate going on about whether, you know, in fact, things are getting better 
getting worse. I know that sounds like a simplistic question, but it's actually an enormously complex one. Because if you look at some of the things like public health, longevity, are people living longer? They are. Like, if you look at humanity as a whole, things are getting better. Does that mean that things are getting better if you're a rural American, or an American living in a small town, or trying to, to help out your family? Then it gets a lot more complex. And I think that embracing the complexity, which is hard for us to do as journalists, because we're inherently focusing on the day by day, we're not looking at the trend over centuries or even decades. We're looking at kind of what happened right now, what happened yesterday. But it, the focus on the momentary is part of our problem right now with trust, and it's part of the outrage problem, because in the moment, we've all gotten angry in the moment. It actually takes some time, distance, perspective, and thought to think about solutions and what healing might look like. I'm sorry if I sound too therapeutic. I can talk about news. No, so, so Julia, you work for a, news, uh, a water service. So that's a little bit, it's a little harder to engage in the community and, and you officials. What, what, what do you think of this issue? Sure, I mean, so we have dual missions. Uh, like most news organizations, we, you know, for us, breaking news is our bread and butter and always will be to some extent. So we have to cover the day to day. And so to some extent, especially in the current administration, there's going to be outrage associated with that. And um, I think there has definitely been a pullback. It doesn't mean that we have to report every, every screaming fit, but it means that we contextualize it and that we fact check it and that we um, that we put it in context and, and we explain things and we do take a step back and, and show the big picture of it. But the other side of the journalism that we're doing is the longer term pieces and um, and that's the kind that provokes a different kind of outrage, the long term outrage where we're exposing corruption and, and change, working to change laws and, and, and hopefully that's the journalism that stays with people that is meaningful to you. Um, you know, I don't think, you know, it's a hard one because um, you can't ignore the statements of a president in, in some respects, no matter how outrageous they are. <laughs> I would argue you kind of can, though, because, I, and I don't, again, I don't want to personalize this, but the utterance of outrageous things by people in power is not always an insult to you. So, I agree, yeah. One thing, one thing we've all learned is that saying things and then doing things sure. are different things. Yes, and I don't think we rush to the wire with every utterance by the president. No, but no, no. Yeah. But um, it took a moment of training. Yes, I think it definitely did. Politicians of all, of all stripes, of all, again, of all stripes, saying outrageous things doesn't mean that their actions, in terms of how they're voting, what regulations they issue, how they're using their political power, like that takes more dignity. That's more Absolutely. behind the scenes. Yeah. Where there's the surface. And that's and that's the important work. That's a good reason. <laughs> My child. <laughs> and that's the that's the that's the much harder work. The work that um, that some of those the, those news organizations that you were talking about don't really do the, the 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 permanent outrage machines on the left and the right that are just there for clickbait they don't do that kind of reporting they're not out there to to do long term investigative things that take real resources and real money please pay for news um, <laughs> starting with the Fresno Bee yes starting with the Fresno Bee buy a digital subscription. <laughs> That takes a lot of money and a lot of resources and a lot of commitment and a lot of digging. And you know, th they don't do that kind of work because um, they just want clicks right now of whatever salacious thing, and then they move on to the next thing tomorrow. Okay, so Scott, um, to transition from what Julian said, because and this will be my last question, and I'll open it up uh, to you guys for questions. Um, so you mentioned, and I mentioned partisan news sites. Doctors have a Hippocratic oath. Lawyers have oaths that they take, and, and is should we, as a, you know, and I don't have any idea how we would accomplish this, but um, should we have a standard set of principles, not ethical guidelines that SPJ puts out, but actual enforceable things that if, though, if you do not do, if you misrepresent yourself when you're interviewing somebody, or you take money from somebody to, to get the story, which yeah, nobody in the mainstream really does, but there are people out there who do do that in you know, National Enquirer, <clears throat> you know, uh, those types of places. I, is it worth putting the energy into an effort to police ourselves in a policing way? No. I, I'm, I'm with Steve on this. I, I just, I feel like um, 
there's plenty of people out there watching everything each other are doing and we have to do our own best work and that is that is the only thing i should concern myself right now um, i think about these other things it's my profession i used to have to think about them in different ways when i was in another job um, but i it's i'm not i'm not the the journalism police um, and and i would also say just on the on the last subject i would say i'm also I'm very much agreeing with what Juliet said, but in a slightly different way, which is I am not in the business of not telling people things. And I'm going to tell them things, and they're going to have to figure out for themselves how they feel about it. And I'm going to tell them something that happens every day, and I'm going to tell them a bunch of stuff that we're working on long term. But I am not, I'm not in the business to, to withhold things from people who read the Washington Post. It's not what I do. Um, it has to be done right. We've all said that. But I think that fundamentally is how you have to think about this. And whether or not, which, and I do agree with you, Sol, but whether or not someone doesn't follow through with their words, that's something we should write about. But the simple fact that these things are being said by the people who are saying right now in our country is important, and it's, it can be harmful. And, I, and I, I think that is very important for people to understand, both in real time and then over the longer term. Anyway, I'm sorry if I, did I not answer that in the, the first, okay. Uh, Lyndon Johnson famously said, if he took his shoes off and walked across the Potomac, the press would say that he, the president couldn't swim. Is it uh, something that would improve trust in the media if more credit was given for things where credit was due, as opposed to kind of the attack attitude that the media tends to have towards our government officials. I'm not sure we don't give credit where credit's due. I, I, but I, it, it's also we are, we're going to relentlessly look at these people who work for us. And, and we are going to focus first and foremost on things that are not going very well. Um, and, and yes, that leads to a general negativity. But are, we're reporting Every month we report job job numbers are up. President is the you know he's he's running the economy. Uh, whether when it began, when it stopped, fine. We can have that discussion. But I, I don't I sort of don't buy the premise that we don't write when things are going well for for the president. And and we're not in the business of 
Um, this is a country that, that, that is evolving all the time. It takes a, a tremendous amount of work to get better. And that's what we bring to our coverage of, of the government. Um, and it's, I, I just, I feel like there is credit where credit's due, but, but make no mistake that, that first and foremost, the great ProPublica slogan, we're interested in the betrayal of public trust. We're interested in what these people are doing on our behalf. Um, and if, those, those are the things, and, and maybe that's the bias, right? Our bias is toward, is, is toward accountability. Um, and so I, I, I take your point. At the same time, I think more credit, I think credit is given when it's due. And it can be done in opinion columns, but it can also be in the, in the kinds of news stories we're writing when, when news that seems positive comes out. I would add that uh, you know Republicans don't um, have a have a foothold on disliking the press when it reports negatively on them. You know I, I spent 12 years in Sacramento. I headed the bureau there, and I saw our responsibility as being a watchdog for the people. And the people who are in charge in Sacramento are Democrats. So that meant that when we did investigative reporting and when we uncovered wrongdoing, it was primarily by Democratic institutions led by Democrats. And you know, plenty of Democrats did not like that reporting, and that was our job. That's your money being spent, and um, misdeeds being done by people who are elected by people in California. And so I don't, you know, it was ever thus. I don't know. That's our job is to hold these people accountable. And. Yeah, I, um, I had a question uh, about local journalism. We most of this country is covered, um, you know, by smaller newspapers, smaller news outlets, and a lot of the ideas you have for improving public trust are things that they can't do. Um, you have counties where there's a single newspaper and there's no one else picking up the story, so there's no kind of confirmation by association. And then um, also, they don't have the staff to upload all of these documents. They're, they're just trying to, to get the content out and trying to do investigative uh, pieces. So what are your thoughts on how those types of outlets, smaller outlets, can try to improve, improve public trust? Really in a void of, of what you're talking about there. 
I would say do, do the stories that you can do and do them well. Don't try to be all things to all people. You know, cover your community. Um, if you don't have the bandwidth to do the investigative, then, then focus on, on the spot news, but do it meaningfully. Be at your city council meeting, you know. Those, those are the stories that are not getting told anymore as we've seen local news decline. Those are the things that are affecting people in your community. Um, you know, the city council meeting, the, the local boards, the school board, those people care tremendously now about their local schools and we're not, that coverage is disappearing as we've seen the news landscape disappear. And those stories matter to people and that's how you get engagement, I think. You provide something that people can't get anywhere else and that they care about and, and tell it in a, in a good way, tell it in a, in a good storytelling way, in a way that matters to them, you know, not a boring meeting story. One reason I decided to go from a national news organization to a regional one is because I'm very interested, concerned in the kind of the questions that you raise. Just this week, there's been some very interesting developments. The Knight Foundation, which is a philanthropy based in Miami, and the Lenfest Institute, which is a nonprofit organization based in Philadelphia. They're doing a lot of work right now to try to support local journalism. Journalism like that done by the president of being led by Joe, as we heard Julia and I were in earlier today. I would urge everyone in America to start local. Subscribe to your local news outlet. It does not matter who owns it, what you think the inclination or meaning is, whether or not or whether even you think it's good enough. Let's start local, because many of our solutions have to be start from a little ground up. To be frank, the national the issues facing the national journalism, out, journalism outlets, I think, and I don't want to speak for the, my counterparts here, but I think that the, there's a rosier prospect for that. Um, certainly, we've seen a great resurgence for the Washington Post, which is, it, it's just been an incredible run. It helps that, you know, it was bought by uh, Jeff Bezos. It helps that there's funding. But it also, but even more important than just the funding, the ownership has been tremendous work by journalists and tremendous improvements in technology. That's one of the hardest things for local journalism right now is that so much money has to be spent to get the software engineers and coders and developers to make really good websites. And journalism doesn't have a lot of money right now. So we need support for that technological um, infrastructure come from. And that's one of the giant problems. If you look at places, though, I'm, I'm hopeful right now, if you look at places like um, for America. That's an initiative that, like Teach for America, is trying to send journalists into communities and places across the country that don't have enough journalists. I urge supporting them and learning more about their community. Oh, one more question. Um, is it okay? Uh, so what he didn't say is that we actually work for the San Jose newspaper south of here in Tulare County. We're actually a report for American Newsroom. So we'll be getting a reporter in June. Um, but I did want to ask your guys' uh, perspective on how do we get people engaged in local journalism, finding the more wonky city, civil government uh, aspects of local, you know, that's not very sexy as, you know, what you guys work a lot of time, because it pulls a lot of, uh, it pulls a lot of attention your guys' way, and we're trying to pull a lot of attention our way. So how do you su how do you suggest that we go about that? It's it's really no different than you have to find ways of engaging people. You have to you have to be able to tell non sexy stories in a sexy way, and that comes with a lot of practice. It comes with trial and error. It comes with all kinds of it comes with completely different ways of telling those stories. Um, maybe they're not stories. Maybe they're uh, paragraphs and, and, and graphs. Maybe that's how you tell that story. Again, that's, that's online, um, but that's where everything's going. So if, if, if small papers are not investing in technology at the same time they're trying to, to do other things, they're, they're doing it wrong. Um, it, you have to, these small places have to get as technologically savvy as the bigger ones. Um, and it doesn't have to be as expensive, they're smaller. Yeah. But it, it's essential, um, and uh, and you know, young reporters have to learn how to own a story. Um, I, I started at Hollister Freelance, five thousand, you know, five thousand readers, a tiny forgotten cousin of the Fresno Bee here, um, and it was a fantastic experience. What you have to tell every young journalist is that wherever you want to end up, if you want to end up at the LA Times or the AP or ProPublica. Um, you're going to have maybe a bunch of jobs leading up to it. They're all great jobs. Um, 
it, they, they're all uh, it, incredibly meaningful in their own way. And some of the things I learned in Hollister 30 years ago, um, I think about once a week when I'm doing my work right now. So it, it's not a great answer to your question, but, but that is the challenge. And, and I don't think it's fair to say, you know, school boards are kind of boring most of the time, but it's important. I, I, think, you, I think you'd surprise yourself by finding out that they're really not that boring, that the people behind them are pretty interesting, how they learn, the way they think about things. Um, bring that into stories uh, is, I think, what, what makes them work rather than kind of a straight report on, on what the council did last night. Um, Talk to the parents, talk, you know, keep talking to all of those people. You need to cover it like a beat, and that means talking to those people all of the time, and then you'll find the rhythm of what are the stories that matter, what are the stories that engage, and how do I tell it in a meaningful way, not what was this vote that they took last night. And in social media as well. Yeah, and I think absolutely. you really, that's a way to own these stories in small places. Yeah. I, I suspect that some of your subjects may not speak English, and we're not speaking well, and we can find translators to go in, go in depth. Today we come together as putting fake news behind us and earning the trust of the American people back. I think today with the media, you guys throw the American people a bone, but there's never no meat on it. You guys are plagiarizing the public, and the American people are hit for it because of the internet. We we're able to get news with links with DreadReport.com, one of the number one news sources that I'm pretty sure that most of you guys heard of and even go to. People today want meat on their bone. People today heard that the Clinton Foundation has lost 90% of their contributions after Hillary Clinton isn't holding no power within government. How come those things ain't covered? Today, the American people voted for Trump. Most people back his agenda, but 90% of the coverage that the mainstream media puts on this president it's demoralizing, putting them down. At the same time, you're putting the American people down. The American people don't want to be plagiarized anymore. Put some more meat on that bone. That's why your local T um, Fresno B is failing. The majority of the media today is left-leaning media, and the American people know it. The majority of the American people are not left-leaning people. We voted for Barack Obama across party lines because people believe in hoping change. Across party lines, people voted for Donald Trump. Why? Because it's the American people's will. You think it's Donald Trump's position that he wants to build and secure our border? That's the will of the American people. We want our safety. And so when you guys don't cover certain topics because of whatever reason, that's why we don't trust you guys anymore. That's why alternative media is the one where everybody's going, because we feel there's the meat on the bone. And as long as you guys keep plagiarizing, the American people know that, you, you're never going to get our trust back. You, you'll never get it, because you, the American people are hip to you guys plagiarizing the masses Sir. and propagandizing. Sir, there's a lot here to unpack. I'm not trying to disagree or confront your point of view, but if you don't trust us in our publications, I respect that. I respect that. But there are two young men to your left who are doing local news right here in Tulare. Maybe one, one of the ways we try to restore trust, sir, is by more face-to-face -face communications like we're doing tonight, more, more at focus on local news. Um, you know, uh, Joe, who we've had the pleasure to get to now, he's very, very open. He told me that his phone number is listed. I probably should have disclosed that. But, you know, I think he cares a lot about this community. You know, um, I, I don't think we're here tonight to talk about President, uh, or about Barack Obama, but we are here to talk about trust. I hear what you're saying. You know, give us a chance, and give us a chance to listen to the diversity of the people we're trying to cover and listen to. The media in America today, there's a, a news organization called Infowars.com with Alex Jones. Alex Jones gets millions of people going to his website on a daily basis. But the United States government today, and Facebook, Twitter, and all these other social media sites, all deep platforming him. 
Do you guys think that organization, Alex Jones, deserves the freedom of speech and the freedom of press just like you guys do? I absolutely, I, absolutely. I am on the board of the First Amendment Coalition. I absolutely believe that Alex Jones has the same First Amendment rights as everyone in this room, as you and me and everyone on the stage. I Have you guys defended him, him? I would not put him in the same category as the, any of the work that we do here. We have talked about our intensive work that we do to report factually on the news every day and ask to be held accountable for it. But you don't know, think it's, it's, it's apparent that if more people are going to where the meat's on the bone and they're less going to you guys, maybe that's something that you guys might want to copy. He talks about topics that you guys won't cover. The Clinton Cab. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thanks very much. Okay, I just wanted to briefly, we're done. If you're interested, we definitely want you to come back. Professor Bowen and I are very, you know, we're doing a lot of these things. We want to know what you like, what you didn't like. So if you are interested in taking a Uh, on, on the mic, I just want to uh, remind everybody that I